Oh, that was a satisfying one. <laughs> I'm gonna zoom in a touch just to give. Yeah, that'll be better. That'll be. Okay, everybody. Um, today for Art in Action, we're featuring Brittany Otto. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Okay. Um, she is a paper artist and she specializes in 3D paper cutouts. Uh, to get the full effect, you really have to check out her uh, webpage. Uh, so you see that they're in light boxes and different layers. So they're really sculptures. Uh, today, because of time resta restraints, she's going to be working on a single layer paper cutout. She started yesterday and she's going to be continuing as much as she can today. Hello, everybody. So yeah, right now, um, that was a wonderful introduction. Thank you so much, Steen. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and this gives an idea. Right now, I'm working on a single layer butterfly piece. This is where we're at so far on the clean side. Um, I'm hoping today, uh, so this section down here is what I got done in an hour yesterday. So things tend to be fairly tedious, but it's very fun and just kind of relaxing to a process to do. Uh, and I hope that you guys are having a wonderful day. Sounds like I'm getting some feedback on someone's computer end in my audio. But um, there we go. Anyway, um, yeah, so if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask, and I will do my best to answer them. And. Yeah, let's I want to see if I can get to this this lower wing section. Fun and satisfying after all of these little tiny detail cuts. Um, yay. But yeah, all of the work that I do, uh, all the original designs and everything, I hand draw everything with just a pencil and I use just an exacto blade or similar. Blade. And these are very <laughs> tiny, tiny little cuts. Just going to try and adjust camera to give you guys a better angle. There we go. Usually I cut out the details first to maintain the structure of the paper. Uh, so that when I get to the larger pieces, there's less likelihood of tearing and damage or mistakes in that way. Um, the hand cutting processes, there's, there's a certain amount of pressure you have to exert on the blade to make sure that you can get through the thickness of the paper. The paper that I'm using is 140 pound weight watercolor paper.
just gonna grab my tweezers. Tweezers are great for tiny work. <laughs> And that one's going to be a little too small for too small. doing with the knife, so we're going to be doing just a little pinprick through to note where the hole needs to be, and then I use a needle and just to get through that. And then just make some of these a little more rounded. It's hard to do these little tiny, teeny tiny circles by completely by hand. So sometimes using a needle or a pin can help with just rounding out that edge just a little bit. Tiny organic lines. Brittany, I know you were talking about this yesterday, but if you could explain to everybody how you have to limit your time because of the pressure you use. Oh, yeah. Um, so one of the things, and this is something that I think is important for a lot of artists, is like, as much as this is what I do with a lot of my time, I still have to ration how much time I spend doing, uh, doing this cutting per day because the repetitive movement um, and the amount of pressure that I have to exert with doing all these tiny little movements, uh, it can build up um, some strain in arm and elbow and such. Um, so I limit myself to a certain, like, I don't, I don't, do this all day every day like I still I limit myself to a few hours in a sitting just to make sure that I can continue doing this uh, for years to come because um, I think that's something that some artists take for granted <laughs> um, I've noticed it kind of more a little bit actually with um, digital artists because you know you're just right there at the computer and you can just keep going for however long and I've, I've heard some stories from some, some fr artist friends of just like spending too long uh, with a stylus in hand. And that can lead to like carpal tunnel and stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, so because of that, I only do this for a few hours a day, but um, it is still a very calming and meditative process for the most part. And in a way, taking that time as opposed to rushing through something, in my in my experience, creates creates a better piece. Because every time when you're looking at a piece fresh, you're just kind of you have new eyes on it, and sometimes in creative in the creative scope of things, you know, you need a little bit of time to just let the let the design sit and just kind of mull it over. 
and it slows the process down just a bit so that, you know, you can take that time and make those small adjustments as you go. Uh, da, 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 da. But yeah. There we go. Just want to get through this little, these little bits here, and then we're going to start in over here. Um, working with paper, it's a, it's a surprisingly hard medium in terms of not necessarily like difficult hard, but it is like everything that you do tends to like, you have very hard edges. Like everything is kind of crisp a lot of the time. Um, I haven't, had much luck with experimentation with torn edges for my work uh, although that could soften things but you know it's interesting because the the tactic that I'm taking with this particular piece is trying to create kind of a brush stroke painterly feel in the paper and the movements and the, the cuts of the piece um, Which is, which is an interesting style to me to play with at times because things could just be so structured and so creating these organic feeling pieces and trying to make the paper look like it's been cut, like a paint, a brush stroke. I think it's a fun challenge for this piece. That's ten, that tends to be what I do for for my work a lot of the time is, you know, uh, every time I start a new piece, I try and look at it and I'm like, okay, what, what kind of new thing or what kind of experiment or tech or, you know, technique do I want to try working on or, or trying out or experiment with? It's always just a fun puzzle and trying something new and developing with each piece. I think that is very valuable to kind of look at, look at developing your own art style in that way, more so than trying to be perfect right out the gate. It's more about creating and experimenting and learning through process and finishing a project and being happy with it in the moment and then moving to the next piece and being like, okay, what do I want to try this time? It's actually kind of cool looking back to some of my older work <laughs> and what I've, where I, where I started and where I am now, because I started doing paper cutting and this kind of uh, three-dimensional work and stuff in 2016. So even in just those few years, I've come a long way. I believe I've created over 150 um, 3D designs in that time. I've definitely been over a hundred. I don't know where I'm at exactly right now. I could look, but I'm well over a hundred at this point. Okay. Here we go. It's wing time. Starting out again with the smaller pieces and to maintain the integrity of the paper.
Okay, there we go. And I'm going to start here with this smaller spot. And then we're going to We're going to be doing some very thin lines here. which takes a bit of concentration. Some of how it like gets kind of nerve wracking at some points doing these very thin lines. Um, and a lot of it comes down to order of operations of which lines are you going to do first to maintain the paper. Okay, here we go. This is why I do the tiny details first. I'm going to come here, stay thin over there, get that nub, and then there we go. Come in with the tweezers a little bit. Ha! Ah, yes. Look at that line. So there's the start of that. It's so thin. Woohoo! Okay. Next. It's all about managing where you're cutting first. Those lines are so thin. It, it's almost like a spider web there. Yeah. <laughs> it's nerve wracking, but it's going to look really pretty when it's finished. Even this right in here is pretty thin. This little nub right here, like the right Right here is a very thin line. But again, this is why I did all of these little details previously. So that when I came in on these, they, these would already be done. So I wouldn't have to go back in and then potentially pull or um, put, put additional strain on these thin lines that I'm working on right now. It's all about working within the bounds of physics. <laughs> Tweezers. Got yep, oh, yep, oh, there we go. Ha ha. Ta da. Okay. It's just nice to somewhat like flip over and just kind of see how the work is progressing, especially with these bigger spaces, because there's just some cool effects. There's a lot of little detail down here first, so before I start pulling on these thin lines up here, I'm gonna start with these bits down here so that that's all finished. Ooh. Ah, this is where the strain comes in. <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay, tiny, thin lines. I really enjoy this kind of delicate work though. Like it's really satisfying. It depends on the, for these single layer cuts, I usually budget, I don't know about budget, but I usually kind of allow for 
the cutting process of these to it's usually again depends on the designs but usually it takes like at least three hours or so to get through one of these single layer um, five by seven cuts when I'm doing layers for my three-dimensional work um, the uh, the layers are, are different with how much detail or <clears throat> or cutting work goes onto each of those so it's harder to gauge how long a particular layer is going to take uh, but when something is like a single design on a single layer it's like okay well this is clearly has a shit ton of detail or not <laughs> so. uh, do you mean that the single layer have more cuts to them you think than the multi-layers per layer yeah because it's the entire design encapsulated into one sheet as opposed to being spread over multiples um so while there's like it's it's basically like a single layer cut design of this size for the layer at hand tends to for the single sheet tends to take longer than a single sheet of a three-dimensional box of the same size because with that one they're like i mean again it depends highly on the design and and how much detail is in the design initially um it's it's very <laughs> i don't know <laughs> i don't know what i'm trying to go with that but yeah basically like the amount of time that it takes to do one of these pieces varies significantly depending on the design and the detail level in it and what's involved with it um, but even that said like a single layer design still like as opposed to uh, a three-dimensional design while it takes less time overall like per layer can sometimes take a lot longer than a single layer of a, of a 3d design just because of what's going on in it I hope that's <laughs> I hope that's a little more. Uh, so it just depends on the design, is what you're saying. Yeah, largely. Um, I used to be like, oh no, like I can I can do a single layer watercolor cut in like six hours total or something like that, and and then at the same time it's like, but then it was like, oh no, wait, some of these are taking a lot longer. <laughs> mm -hmm. Just kind of. Sometimes it would take a little longer than that. I'd be like, what? This is weird. But it's fine. I'm mostly just rambling. I'm pretty good at that. <laughs> just kind of stream of consciousness. Create something interesting to listen to. I think it's interesting to find out what people are thinking as they're actually creating. Yeah. I mean... It's not interesting in my head when I'm doing something like that because I'm just thinking, oh, no, I messed that up. Oh, no, I messed Oh, oh wait, maybe I didn't. <laughs> and that's pretty much all I'm thinking is I'm <laughs> working on something. Oh, so no, I like to I've hear had what some. People are thinking. Yeah, no, I've had some Bob Ross moments. <laughs> 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 I'm like, oh, no, oh, no. Okay, I think I can save this. I think this is this can work. <laughs> Especially when sometimes if you've got a design or something like that and you're like, okay, this is going to be great. And then it doesn't quite turn out the way that you thought. And then you're like, okay, okay. Well, what can we do here to make it feel like I can, I can pull this out and make it feel a little better or stronger? Hey, that was satisfying. Wow. Yeah, this line right here is incredibly thin. And then these ones are a little more robust. But... It's still all thin and tiny. Okay, I'm actually quite excited to see how this section right here turns out. I think that's gonna look really nice. It's actually interesting. Um, straight lines are one of those things that some people get really scared about doing especially freehand. <laughs> um, and I've found that, you know, with, with a lot of my pieces, I have to do straight lines for the edges and such. And 
a lot of where the success or failure comes in with creating a, a, a relatively straight line. Freehand is by where your point of kind of where you're pivoting from, um, where you're pivoting from with the joint that you're pulling with. Um, so like if you, for instance, if you think about it, if like, if you're trying to draw a straight line and you are pulling from the wrist, it's gonna, you're, you're gonna be limited by that curve of what your wrist can do. But then if you extend, extend it up to your elbow or to your shoulder or even your waist, and you just kind of lock everything else and then you just kind of pull, you can get a really nice straight line depending on where your access point is. But these small, tiny bits require more wrist. And then once something is has more of a gentle or a longer curve, then I end up kind of switching up to closer to my shoulder for where I'm where I'm pulling from. I'm just going to get that little bit out there, okay. I'm in like concentration mode. Yesterday felt more chatty and today it's just like lines. <laughs> I have to be super on point. I'm making sure that I'm muting myself quite a bit because I have all my dogs in here. Oh, puppies. They are so noisy. Okay. Let's see. Let's see how okay. this goes. Drum roll. Just kind of, yeah. Sometimes it's a little bit like a tease because, again, because of the hand cut element, sometimes the way that the cut is angled will affect how it pulls out. There we go. Yeah, that's mm, looking good. Beautiful. I think I'm gonna do this one here and then I'm gonna do this one because at that point, no, sorry. I'm gonna do these two now. I'm gonna do this one, then this one, then that one. <laughs> Order of operations. To maintain structural integrity. Sometimes I get questions of like, oh, how often do you end up messing up or tearing the paper? And it's actually not that often because it's a lot of it, like if you start feeling it, like, you know, you can feel how the paper is pulling and you can feel it with the knife. So if it is starting to get a little funky, you can usually tell that and, you know, with sight stuff. I'm trying to do Little tiny details here. There we go. Because I have some of this painterly, like, kind of uh, blobs coming up into the vein of the wings because I wanted that to feel a little more organic. <laughs> Excuse me. It kind of reminds me a little bit. I had this one piece. What is, uh, another one of my watercolor cuts is uh, that I've got, I think it's, I think I have it up in my Etsy store of a seahorse. I remember distinctly when I was making that piece or designing that one, 
as I was drawing. I was really worried about it starting to look a little too much like Spider-Man because the way that seahorses have that kind of that striation and armor type scales on their bodies. <laughs> so I was really proud of the um, of the compromise that I that I came up with in the work because the lines that I did for that I ended up creating some really beautiful, elegant um, lines in that to, to give that feeling of the kind of armament that little seahorses have without, without it looking too geometric. I'm completely looking at your Etsy site right now because I want to see the Spider-Man seahorse. Oh, I can actually grab one of those because I've got a laser cut reproduction that I can grab to show. Pretty sure I've got one somewhere. Oh, I might not. Let me see. I might still have one. We're good. Things are good. Might have one. Do I have one? Seahorse, seahorse, seahorse. Yes, I do. I have one that is unpainted, but. Um, Ooh, sorry. yes, I'm not What's finding that? it on the Etsy store. Yeah. So this one's a laser cut reproduction piece, um, but it gives an idea of, of this kind of kind of creativity and. If I had connected these lines up to stuff, it would have just felt very much like a Spider-Man suit. <laughs> there we go. Okay. And back to the butterfly. But yeah, one of the one of the things when I was drawing this this butterfly out that I was running into was that feeling with the with the wing veins because all of this is going to be paint, which is going to create the pattern of the wing because I wanted that flexibility as opposed to um, specifically designing a wing pattern, like adding in like the spots or the, the, the lines or whatever. So I wanted to stick with just the veins um, for, the, for the cut paper, but I wanted to make sure that it flowed into the rest of the piece as opposed to just feeling very structured and stagnant. So I guess that's kind of what I was trying to go for with, with the words. Like I wanted to express that. That feeling of So I started over here and then I realized that I had this little piece over here that I'd have to cut out. So I'm swapping over to this little bit here. And then getting There we go. And I just realized as I was right there that I had this little bit that I hadn't gotten to yet. So we're gonna do that. <laughs> and again, it would have been so much more difficult if I had done this all before. And then the only points where this paper had structure would have been, if this was all cut out for this piece right here, the only points of structure would have been over here and over here. And that would have just had a really more difficult, a lot more difficult to get that piece cut out. A lot of planning goes into this. A lot of it's spur of the moment, <laughs> but yeah, it's it's a process uh, that continues as you're working on it. And that's kind of what I love about this because it's not just about like for me, you know, like I've got I have a laser cutter here that I have for the for the laser cut reproductions, but just the process and the organic and 
by hand process for me. It's just a big important part of everything because I feel like I can feel what's going on in the piece and make those decisions on a better time scale. And I just like watching a piece grow. It's really fun to, like once I get this section here cut out, I'm gonna flip it over and it's gonna be like, ooh, look where we're coming. It's just satisfying to see the progress. Okay. Let's see. Here. Because of that, I have to, yep, tweezers. Tweezers are the best. Sometimes I have to gently massage. That didn't quite come out all the way. So we're just cleaning that up. There we go. Yeah. That's looking good. Okay, there's another little bit right there. Haha. -ha. Uh, Wolf. Looks almost like a flame. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> were, you, were you trying for that or just the brush or paint strokes? I was going for paint strokes, but I love hearing what other people see and how they're experiencing the work as well. Like, that's just because, you know, like, when you're making an, a piece of art, it's, you know, obviously you have your own vision, but it's also really exciting to hear what other people see when, when you create something. It's just like, ooh, I hadn't thought of that before, that kind of thing. And it's just, it's, it's really fun to hear that, that outside perspective. It's part of what I miss about ha not having <laughs> in-person events for so long is just, having people just kind of enjoy a piece and, and seeing what they have and seeing what what their reaction is and and then talking about what they see. Okay, we're gonna do this little bit is gonna be so when I do these little pinpricks a lot of time I'll just do a little tiny pinprick that will just Barely, it's not fully cutting, like it's not creating a full on cut in the paper, but it's giving me enough of an indication of where I need to poke on the other side. It's hard, I don't think the camera is picking it up very well, but um, that's kind of my own shorthand thing that I tend to do to make sure that I am, this, so that the pokes that I'm making are in the desired location, so I'm not just going in blind. I'm really looking forward to this piece once I have it all cut out because this one is going to be, I, I really am looking forward to it because I want to do the gold edge on this piece again. I'm, I've been really excited about this gold edge stuff. <laughs> if you can't tell. <laughs> if anybody is wondering, um, on your Instagram page, there's a pretty good example of you using a brush to apply your gold dust mix to the yeah. edge. It's 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 a it's a new experiment thing that I'm trying out with of a number of different pieces. I've got a couple of them here I can show. So basically this one I started when I tilt it this way. Look at that gold edge. That gold edge looks so good. Oh, it's so pretty. It just gives a little something extra to the piece. Cause when you look at it, like with just the white edge, it still looks really nice with the white edge. Um, and then by comparison, the white edge, it's very clean. And the gold edge just feels like it gives it a little bit of magic. And of course it depends on the piece and what kind of effect that I want to go for, but it feels really magical to me and I'm really excited about it. I only just started playing with it like this month <laughs> or last month, I should say. Um, so I'm definitely in the experimental stage. 
with that. Just scooching that. There we go. So I've done two pinpricks there. I'm going to do a third right there. Flip it over. One, two, three. This one I want to be a little bigger. That's part of the magic too with, with like this needle in particular, I really like using. It's not a great needle, it's bent, but uh, if I go a little bit in, you know, the di diameter is a little smaller, and then I can go larger than that if I go further in. And just that size differentiation is really fun. It gives that little feeling of motes of light. Sometimes I go back and notice that there's a little bit that didn't quite come out. Get out of there. There we go. Ha -ha. Just gonna get this little bit here done. Just right in here, just kind of trick, 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 trick this way. Okay. Just all these little tiny splatter paint bits or feelings. I love your little ink drops. Sorry, what? Oh, I love your um, noise effects then. The ta ta da. <laughs> Most of the time that just goes on inside my head. That I <laughs> you know, it's just kind of like, woohoo, I did the thing. Look at this. Yeah. It's 
it's very satisfying. Occasionally when I have, have these more that. complex pieces, then I'll just kind of start doing it a little more piecemeal. Like that. We have about five minutes left. Yep. Okay. Good to know. And um, yeah, so it's been a pleasure to be here for sure. I hope everyone's having a good day and a good weekend. Um, this has been a really fun project to share with everyone. It's been a minute since I've been able to share a streamed thing like this. Um, but yeah, as tedious as this is, it's very satisfying. <laughs> I want to see if I can get this little bit here. Yeah, this is a very complex little shape here. It's very funky. Uh, I am very good at creating custom confetti. <laughs> I really, I find it amusing, like these little bits of paper. It's confetti, hand cut, customized confetti, each piece unique. Um, but yeah, if anybody wants to see more of my work, uh, you can certainly find my stuff on social media or check out my artist website um, if you want to see some of the portfolio stuff. Uh, and yeah. Uh, and then I have some of my original work as well as some laser cut reproductions available on my Etsy store for anyone who falls in love with something or if you want to support. I very much appreciate it and I hope that my artwork gives everyone uh, a little bit of happiness and joy in their life. That's part of what makes all this fulfilling is being able to create something that you know, make someone happy and makes them happy to see it when they walk by when it's on their wall or desk or whatever. And just giving them a, something to just lose themselves in just for a little bit. this wing section. It's so cool to see how this takes shape because it starts out as just like one tiny little cut on a piece of paper. And it's really cool to see how it comes together. Come on. There we go. So it's going to be a little tricky because of all the little points. There we go. Clean that up a touch. Yay! Look at that. Whoa. Whoa. That's beautiful. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to seeing how it looks with a watercolor background behind it. Because, actually, let me grab... This is one that I have prepped for a different piece, but, like, just, like, that sort of stuff is just cool. Like that's the plan. It's just going to look like. Mm -hmm. 
not necessarily those colors. Can you that put any spacers idea. between the background? Not usually for these single color pieces or these single single layer cuts. Mm -hmm. um, not usually um, because usually I, I make them so that you know someone can just pick one up and then put it in a frame quick. Um, but that's definitely something that I could do if someone had um, had a custom request for something. That's definitely something that I can do. Um, and I did do it for a really huge diptych, uh, single layer diptych commission that I had at one point. Um, it's on my portfolio website. It's called A Sailor's Tale. That was a big old water dragon piece to... 12 by 24 inch highly detailed cuts and those ones were suspended about a quarter inch above uh, a linen fabric background and it was really beautiful anyway that seems like it's about a good time for stopping i want to see if i can get this done quick ah but um yeah if anybody of... is interested um the Art in Action, Brittany was working on this piece yesterday, is up on YouTube briefly. I don't. I think it's coming back down tomorrow. So if you want to watch that, uh, go to NorwestCon43 YouTube. Um, let's see. Uh, the person, the artist we're going to have up next is Hannah Charlton, who specializes in medieval art, uh, a modern take on it. And she is going to be starting in about 10 minutes. Oh, that's awesome. Her stuff is so cool. Yeah, it's beautiful. I, I think that's my favorite part about NorwestCon is seeing every all the other artists and what they do and just how many styles and medias everybody's working in. Yes. There's a lot of really cool artists and talent in the, in the PNW. Yeah, that wing is starting to show itself. Oh, it's looking so cool. Anyway, um, yeah, so it was a pleasure to have you guys all here. Um, I hope you guys have a fantastic weekend. I will be uh, posting updates as this piece is uh, closer to finished on social media and such. So if you want to give a follow to see that progress, you can. Uh, but yeah, I hope you guys have a fantastic day and weekend full of wonderful people and artists and yeah thank you for having me it was a blast um, and thank you this was just fascinating to watch and just to <laughs> see as it comes to life so thank yeah. you for sharing your time and your of energy course. with us my pleasure but yeah i hope you guys again have a fantastic weekend it was a great time being here um and I will leave you, leave you all in the wonderful hands of Steen and Hannah next. But yeah, have a great day, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs> okay, bye. So hello, Steen. Hi. <laughs> oh my gosh, that was so cool. Yeah. Oops. I'm trying to type something and my spelling has just gone downhill. Oh no.
Okay. So you're on uh, Facebook and you're streaming? Yes, and uh, we're about to turn on Twitch. So uh, I'm starting in exactly four minutes. Yay! I'm trying to see through the paper to see what that is. Is that? Yeah, so this is the template. Oh, I see. Using. So the parchment is kind of translucent. So I can do the whole design on graph paper and then just trace it directly onto the real material, onto the parchment. And so there's the air meet chat and the zoom chat. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, monitoring. I have the speakers turned off mm -hmm. so I don't get feedback, but I'm monitoring to see if anybody has questions. Ah, super. Thank you. Hey. We've had a lot of folks go wow on the previous uh, session and uh, not many questions, but uh, mm. a lot of uh, comments in Facebook, like cool. And oh, yay. Right. I'll introduce you exactly at two o'clock and awesome. I'm going straight from your website. Okay, great. Yay. Okay, everybody. Today we have Hannah Charlton, who is a uh, an artist who specializes in modern takes on medieval manuscripts. Um, to see her work, it's uh, it, it's incredible. Um, it just reminds me so much of those scripts that the monks used to produce, except that these are just focused on women, essentially. <laughs> which I like. 
so check out her website uh, to get her the full experience, and I'll let you. I'll let you start, Hannah. Awesome! Thank you so much. Great. So yes, hi everybody. I'm Hannah Charlton, and I make medieval style miniatures. So in the way that illuminated manuscripts and books were made before the printing press when they had to be handwritten and hand decorated. So I use a historical process, but I use a lot of modern materials and modern themes. So all of my pieces start with a graph paper template that I draw out in pencil. And this is what allows me to put more complicated pieces together. So like for the book of the City of Ladies piece, which was four or more women in each one, I could actually cut out bits of graph paper, paste it together. It's how I can assemble battle scenes. And then because the material I work through is somewhat translucent, I can just put it on top of the graph paper and trace right onto this. So traditionally manuscripts were made on parchment, which is made from animal skin that's been treated and stretched really thin and scraped so that it's paper thin basically, but it is a lot, a lot tougher than paper is. It's a little bit thicker, it doesn't tear, it doesn't degrade like paper does, and it lasts forever, which is one of the reasons why we still have so many manuscripts, is for one thing, they were always kept under really heavy covers and kept very carefully, but also the material they were based on was really tough. So working on parchment is really nice since it'll last forever, but of course, you run into problems like one side was on the outside of the animal. So you have those little follicle dots. And the other side was on the inside of the animal at one point. And so it would be a lot smoother and easier to work with. And of course, if at any point the animal had a bug bite, once you stretch it out, you would end up with the giant hole that you would have to just write around in most cases. And of course, a lot of bugs would find parchment to be very, very yummy. So it's a tricky material to work with. And so I work with a modern vegan substitute that's treated in a similar way so that it's really tough, it's very thick. And best of all, if you make any sort of mistake, you can use a razor or X-Acto knife to just scrape it off. The material's thick enough for that. So what I have for this is a little Daenerys sketch because I wanted to do something very fun with a baby dragon and with the medieval style drapery that I love. So I always start once the pencil and everything else is finished underneath the parchment. I get to start with a micron pen. And so this will eventually be covered up by the gouache and everything else, but it helps me have a nice permanent outline for underneath. Yes, I tell people that I got into medieval manuscripts once Adobe went to the subscription model for Photoshop. <laughs> I'd been trying digital art for a while. So this was a kind of vindicative yes. choice. <laughs> I feel that. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of it was also, I was um, in university for drawing and two-dimensional art. And so I was learning how to use charcoal and learning about perspective and light and shadow. And I was liking it, but it was still just so frustrating, all of those techniques. And 
then in my art history classes, I learned that, oh, there's this whole other world of medieval art where those rules don't apply in the same way. And I just thought the art was so beautiful and I tried making it for myself and it was like a magic trick. I just loved it. And a big part of that has been the draperies where if you look at them, they aren't accurate exactly to what they would really look like, but they do make geometric sense. They're not so much about being accurate to real life so much as they are about being beautiful, which I think is fun. I really like the really tight angles in a lot of Gothic and medieval drapery. Most of the work I do is taken from the Morgan Crusader Bible, which is currently in the Morgan Library in New York, which, you know, as the title implies, was commissioned for a knight who was going on the Crusades, so a French nobleman. And it's this gorgeous book that's entirely made up of miniature paintings, um, originally, there was no text, um, but over hundreds of years, it got captions in different languages. So first Latin, then Persian, and then Judeo-Persian. So all these languages all on a single book. It's just a beautiful book that other manuscript artists would copy from. And now I copy from it, and it's the best. How does it feel to continue the tradition of hundreds of years? Oh, it's so exciting. <laughs> it's, I do feel really lucky that I get to work in this medium now since so many libraries have digitized their collections. So I can go online and see almost any manuscript in incredible detail. And I can zoom in to see all the individual brush strokes. So there's like a thousand years of history to draw from. And because of this, I have access to all of it. Mm. But I'm going to be able to do it without all those libraries being so generous with their collections. And I always leave the faces for last since all of these lines are going to be covered up and just the friction of me painting and moving around on this page is going to make them fade a little bit. I'll just leave the faces for last. Okay. Good. So the first layer is basically done at this point. So the first set of black lines. And the gold I use is a gold ink instead of gold leaf. Maybe someday, but for now I just use a gold ink that has little tiny particles inside that you can just see shimmer around and oh, it's so cute. And so here we go. 
And working with the grids underneath the parchment also lets me plan some of the colors digitally. So I can just scan in the graph paper and then put digital colors on top. Since I'm working with gouache, I can't really change the colors once they're down. So I can plan a lot of things using not Photoshop. <laughs> I'm using GIMP right now, which is, uh, it's not the best, but it works. And so then I can plan which colors I want to go where. I can make sure that I won't have two things of the same color touching each other. So I'm going to make our dragon friend gold because that will be cute. And the gold is what traditionally would go on after the text since it was pretty messy and the process was basically to go from the riskiest steps to, <laughs> um, and then ending with the more expensive steps. So you would put down the text first since that was honestly where a mistake was most likely to happen. And from there you could add the gold and from there you would add the colors. And in the Middle Ages, colors could be even more expensive than gold because all of these paints were from natural pigments. So the most expensive color would have been blue since blue is something that we see all the time in the sky and in the ocean, but it's not something that we can actually grasp hold of and grind up into paint. So the very best blue color would come from lapis, which was extremely difficult to get in medieval Europe. So if you do see a painting that has a lot of really, really brilliant blue, the blue in that painting would have been more expensive than the gold. Just incredible. I keep forgetting just how expensive pigments used to be and how hard they were to get. Yes. Oh, it's another reason I'm happy to be working now. <laughs> I could use as much blue as I like. Mm -hmm. And even this gold ink is like treated bronze. So I'm not like working with 24 karat ink or anything like that. I think that's another reason why it's important to study material history because it does make a lot of art history make sense when you learn that, oh, this goddess or this figure would always be depicted in blue because they were very important. So they got the most important color. Oh, for the Virgin Mary? Yes. Okay. I had so, never put that together before. Yeah. So she's the queen of heaven. So she has the blue, but also she's the queen of heaven. So she gets the best color. <laughs> Right. So I'm going to go in really quickly and erase the surface to wrap it up just a little bit because you do want the parchment to be slightly rough so it'll accept the paint a little easier.
Ready? So I'm going to use blue for the dress. So this is a cobalt blue gouache. So most of the paints I choose is based on um, how well they dry. So I use the M gram gouaches and then I pour them into palettes and then let them dry. So I can use them like watercolors or honestly like those old Crayola watercolor pans <laughs> that I used as a kid. It does allow me to like mix up some custom colors so I can make up a huge, huge batch and then just come back for weeks and continue using that color. But you just add a little water to wake it up get it to a nice milky consistency and then apply it to the parchment. Yeah, I find that this cobalt blue likes to dry in a nice even looking layer, which is what I always want. So this part of the process is pretty relaxed and easy. Most of the really hard work goes into planning the layouts. So finding reference images, figuring out the drapery and the poses and the layout of everything is what usually takes the most time. So once I'm working on the color, I get to relax a little bit more. Here we go. And the one thing I always like to tell people when they're working is medieval scribes, like how other trades would have a patron saint, scribes had a patron demon whose name was Tetivalis. And his job was to make scribes make mistakes. So, so people would have a little bit of an out if they made a mistake, which would be expensive, but and we all know how easy it is to make mistakes when you're writing. <laughs> and so you could just blame Tetivalis. So that's what I always tell people is if something goes really wrong, you can just say, ah, Tetivalis. Here it is. I was just looking it up on the, on the internet. So I have a little bit of a buckle here in the parchment, which is pretty common for the most part. Those will sort of go down by themselves. But parchment, even this nice vegan stuff I'm using, really, really, really likes to curl up. <laughs> it likes to curl up. It likes to wrinkle. Uh, so if you use too much water, it'll let you know. And if you just leave it out, it will roll up into a tight little roll. <laughs> so one time I had just 
I had stayed up so, so late working on a piece and I finished it. I took off the tape and left it on my desk and I went to bed. And in the morning I woke up and it was gone. It was off the desk. <laughs> it disappeared. And it turns out overnight it had just rolled up and then rolled off the desk. <laughs> so it had just gone onto the floor. Ah. Yeah. So I looked at that demon and there's some really fun medieval uh, portraits of uh, monks working with him, looking yes. over their shoulders. <laughs> yes. I know you have to watch out. <laughs> I mean, it really is, <laughs> it's such a great explanation for those mistakes that you make that just make you go, why, how? <laughs> it's especially important too if you're like, copying a sacred text where a mistake will be repeated for anyone who's copying from your manuscript. So it would have been so important to make sure you get every detail right, but... It's still so hard to do. So you can see I've covered up most of those lines that I put down in the first layer. So they'll show through a tiny bit just because there's that little indent in the parchment. But for the most part, I'm gonna be just recreating them on top of the gouache once it dries. I wonder if there's a tech equivalent of Tativilus. There must be. Or it might just be Tativilus again. What was that? <laughs> there, there, there must be some like tech equivalent, like some oh. patron demon of tech. The gremlins? <laughs> yes. <laughs> some little creature who just goes in and just makes things go wrong for no reason. Go how? There we go. Yeah. I used to work. Oh, go on. Oh, sorry. Oh, I was asking how hard your brush was because I can hear it. Oh my goodness. Is it just the microphone? Is that sensitive? That's possible. Oh my goodness. Let's see. And I do use um, just little Simply Simmons round brushes. So they're, let's see, I don't think they're too hard. Let's 
Yeah, I guess. My goodness, I never noticed that. On a pretty rough surface, I guess. Cool brush go. So I'll finish this last little drapery bit here. And then I'm going to take a cue from the last artist and go at a few things with the exacto knife. <laughs> Fix any little issues. So for the most part on the paintings I do, the whole surface is eventually covered with gouache, either gouache or gold, uh, except for the hands and hair, which I go over with a really light wash. And that makes the figures stand out a little bit. It's like little cutouts. Ding. Right. right, so I have an exacto knife that I keep in a little 14 hands cork <laughs> and I can then use the exacto knife to scrape off any mistakes I think are there so if I don't like how this bit of blue ended up getting onto the gold I can just scrape it off if I'm not I don't quite like let's see I'd like this thumb to be a little bit thicker so I'll just go in onto the blue. It makes a tiny, tiny difference. You can definitely hear that when it goes. <laughs> All right, we have a stray mark there. Yeah. There we go. Now we have a nice gold dragon. Neat. And so for the outlines, I'll use a uh, micron again or a little brush pen for a little bit more thickness. And this process really is just so hard on the microns. <laughs> I go through them so quickly. But I can draw them onto the parchment, onto the gouache, even onto the golds. They're great to work with. When I do this activity with kids, I actually use fine tip Sharpies just because we need something that will go on top of everything just to make that final sort of snap into place. 
make everything really pop. So the Morgan Crusader Bible was, some people think, completed by people who had some experience in stained glass because all the miniatures have these really heavy black outlines. Makes it look very graphic, very, very comic booky, which is great. Great. So the gouache is playing nice for the most part. You can see it's buckling a little bit, but a lot of those really, really fine creases have mostly died down. I'm not working with as many variables as I would if I was working with actual parchment, but still, <laughs> I feel like this material sometimes just Likes to play a few tricks on me. Doesn't want it to be too easy. And no bug bites. No bug bites. It's like when people say they want a tattoo of like some manuscript thing. It's always, oh, that's a bit, it's going to be a bit morbid since... <laughs> All of those were originally drawn on skin. So <laughs> that's skin that was bleached and stretched. So ooh. So the project I'm working on now is based on the book of the City of Ladies by Christine de Pizan. Does anyone know that one? There used to be a series of calendars out, the Illuminated Women's Calendar, Medieval. Ooh. Yeah, I haven't been able to find it in a while, but they took a lot of their pieces from that, the Christina de Pizan. Yes. Oh my gosh, she's the best. Yeah, it's so fun to explain about like, well, it's a great women of history book, but written from a medieval perspective. <laughs> so you can imagine that. Oh, it's so fun. Yeah. Stay, stay down. I do want people to really like my work and to be very excited by it. So I do want it to look like a bunch of gems and jewels, <laughs> but I also want people to learn, um, especially since the Middle Ages and the early modern period are just so diverse and so different from what we think.
a major source for Christine was um, Giovanni Boccaccio, Boccaccio, who wrote a similar book called Famous Women, which was very much like hers, but um, focused on famous women, evil women. <laughs> uh, he was, it, it wasn't a feminist work in quite the same way <laughs> as Christine talking about like great women in history who had all of these great impacts on mankind. He wrote about like evil queens and things. So, <laughs> uh, but it's really interesting. And Christine uses him a lot and sometimes debates with him, which is really fun. And so one thing that he says is um, he talks about the goddess series who he claims was a real woman who was just very, very smart and figured out how to plant and harvest grain. And he sort of finds her responsible for feudalism and inequality. And so he says with, once people started like planting grain and having farms, um, they had to start like dividing up the land and they could no longer have their possessions in common and people started hoarding wealth and hoarding grain. And it's, it was all her fault. <laughs> it was all her fault. And so you know, and on one hand, you're like reading a medieval anarchist <laughs> who's uh, but also he's blaming, you know, the rise of inequality on a single woman who yeah. invented cereal. So yeah. yes, like, well, they blamed everything on Eve too. Yeah, yes. Eve is also in his book, of course. What was his name again? Um, Boccaccio, B O C C. First name, Giovanni. Okay, I'm, I'm putting these names into uh, the chat. Nice, nice. Yeah. Yeah, his book is absolutely fascinating. It's a lot of that where you go, wow, Giovanni, that's really progressive. And then you go, oh, no, Giovanni, no. What did you do? <laughs> so... But he, he is very supportive of women being educated, and um, he argues that women are really capable and have a lot of potential and a lot to offer. So you can see why Christine read him and also why she argued with him in her own book. But his books also tend to have more illustrations. so. For my series, um, I drew from famous women when I was looking for visual references.
So the skin in here is a wash instead of a solid opaque color like everything else. Which again allows them to stand out a little bit from everything else in the piece. So because the parchment already has kind of nice warm undertone, it doesn't take very much. Maybe a little bit of pink and orange. And a little brown and that'll take you most of the way. Wait. Wait. a few minutes. Are there any questions? Does anyone else want to hear more about Boccaccio's bad takes? <laughs> <laughs> I would love to hear more. Um, I have been, there's been some comments, but I haven't seen any questions. Um, oh, people are kind of coming and going. Andy. Like right now we have four people watching. Yay, hello folks. Yeah. This last bit is fun when I get to just embellish a little bit. So being careful because if you add water to the dried gouache, just like when it's in the palette, it'll wake up again and start spreading. So I always say, oh, it's such a tough medium. Like they've lasted for hundreds of years, but if you get water on one of mine, like it's, it's gone, it's kaput. <laughs> get it in a frame, right? The last most fun part is the hair. Okay. And we're coming up on five minutes right now. Perfect. And is this one going into your store? Uh, this one? This is just on a little five by seven. So, I mean, possibly if folks are interested, I get uh, my prints made locally. And um, so then the prints are a lot more stable and less wrinkly than the originals. But then I uh, paint the golds back in. And that's another reason for me to use gold ink. So they'll be... Like here's something that's off of the table so you can kind of see they'll still be shiny. Yeah, if people would like this original or this as a print, by all means. This has been a, I like Danny. Yeah, again, if you have any interest at all in manuscripts, I recommend checking out the Morgan Library in New York. They've digitized their collection, so you can see all these manuscripts in just impossible detail, like closer than you could ever get in person. I'm going to take my exacto knife and put some little highlights in her eyes. I have it here. And hey, bingo. So I 
can then take off paint and you can see it's already starting to curl. <laughs> so if I were to leave this, it would probably curl itself into a little roll and go tumbling off. There it is, and it is shiny, yes! That's, I think, where all the magic is. And honestly, that's probably why I got into this medium was, once I made it myself, I could actually see that shiny gold. And it was like... Very jewel-like. Yes, exactly like jewels. Yeah. I make art for magpies. <laughs> for magpies and women so <laughs> yep. come on by okay well i'm you just timed that out beautifully i'm, yeah. I'm impressed <laughs> oh my goodness i'm so pleased yeah <laughs> okay so everybody that was hannah charlton um check out her website she has some um, uh, a lot of pieces from uh the magnificent um <laughs> Let's see the Christine de Passan's work, the Book of Women. Yeah. Um, and a lot of things from Game of Thrones, which <laughs> I thought I didn't even realize what that was at first. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Well, thank you very much for your time and sharing thank your you. process with us. Oh my gosh. Thanks so much for having me. This has been so fun. Mm -hmm. Enjoy the con. Okay, well, thank you, and we're we're just about ready to close up for the day. For well, no, I forgot one more person. Lizzie D. Hill is back after this. Uh, she's going to be showing everybody um, the work she put into her coloring book, "Wickedly Whimsical Witches," and uh, how she got a Kickstarter campaign to fund it. Ooh. So, if you want to watch that, it, it was interesting. She was uh, showing her. Um, the book that she's working on when the fireflies came yesterday. And if you want to see anything from the uh, yesterday presentation, it's going to be available on YouTube uh, short, for a short time. And that's look under NorwestCon 43 YouTube. And is there, I don't see any questions. So, well, thank you again. Thank you. Hey. Yeah, my dogs were so good this time. <gasps> good dogs. Such good dogs. Yeah. All right. See you there. Hi. Ah. Yeah. I. I. Yeah, we're not um, live right now. Oh, good. I'm so yeah. Going, Has anybody seen this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, we're not live. I'm actually watching us on Facebook and. Um, uh, air meat. And okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna run off for a second. That's fine.
My all my dogs were so good. They were all in the same room. And nobody was barking. It was amazing. <laughs> That's nice. I ended up missing it. I was trying to do some last minute tweaks to my thing. There was images not showing up on my slideshow and it was just like, ah! so I ended up missing it. I'm all, oh, shoot. So oh, it's uh, available oh, that's um, right. on YouTube okay. right now. Uh, I think that they're planning on taking everything down at the end of the con. Okay. But everything from yesterday is up on YouTube right now. And it's, um, it will be up also. Okay. So I got to ask before we go live. Oops. We are live. We are live. Oh. Yes. I just realized we're, we started streaming again. <laughs> oh. Well, I just okay, was hoping that I, huh? You can put it in chat if you don't want to share. No, no, no. It's okay. I was just in there wondering how I looked yesterday since my camera was on while I was sharing. So, I was Oh, just... no. Nobody did anything embarrassing. <laughs> no, well, I'm pretty sure I didn't pick my nose or anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Uh, yes, we are live. So, All right. Hello, everyone that's in. So um, do you want to get started or do we want to wait till the appropriate time? It is, it's five minutes till, mm -hmm. so. It's up to you. Um, I will do the introduction exactly at three. Okay, so why, we could just chat, it's okay. So. Okay, I can show you one of the dogs on my lap. <laughs> He's a it sounds, I was about to say, it sounds like he needs to lose weight. <laughs> Yeah, he's cat. a good dog. <laughs> That's good. He looks like a sweetie. It, so. He's he's an emotional support dog for my autistic child. Oh. And he's very, very good at what he does. I'm oh, very pleased with that. Um, but yeah, he is a food monster. <laughs> the vet would like to see him lose a couple pounds. My kitty's a little, I mean, I say she's fluffy and she is, but she's actually, she has some extra fluff underneath the fur as well. So <laughs> she's kind of on a, mm -hmm. a diet that I'm trying the best at. Honestly, I grew up on a farm. We never had indoor cats. We had cats, but that's, I mean, they were out mm -hmm. there to catch the mice. And so we also get an indoor cat as an adult. And I tell you what, it's a totally different world from a farm cat. <laughs> so... <laughs> So we have a dog who is allergic to just about everything. And wow, he's really? allergic to um, all animal sources of protein. So he's on a homemade vegetarian diet right now. Wow. And if you had asked me a few years ago, would I be cooking every day for my dog? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. 
Never thought you would be cooking fondue. Not not fondue. I'm sorry. Um, um, I was thinking of the other thing, the, the soy bean. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm talking Tofu. Tofu. Oh, that's actually, I'm, I'm cooking him like lentils and chickpeas and, you know, just beans in general. Yeah. But again, I, I never even imagined something like that in my busy life, you know, as a mom. And <laughs> I was going to be cooking special gourmet meals for my dog so he can stay alive. Oh, dear. That's, that's crazy. <laughs> Poor dog. <laughs> mm -hmm. But... Nah, I just, my cat just gets bored. She bored eats. So then we have to keep her entertained. So mm -hmm. that's kind of what we've been learning. So, and it's, the weather's been beautiful. So all of a sudden she wants outside, but we live in an apartment complex. So it's like, I, if, if I had a backyard, I would let you go frolic kitty, because then I knew you had a place to come to that is safe, but mm -hmm. I don't. So we try our best. Sometimes I take her on a walk, put a leash on her. And sometimes um, we just get out and follow her around. <laughs> yeah. I almost feel like she's a prisoner. <laughs> you know, we're the jail people. Keep an eye on her. No escape. But <laughs> anyways, oh my goodness. I got an itchy nose. Excuse me. <laughs> mm. Somebody's sneaking about me and they won't stop. <sighs> it's, the, it's, it's spring. Yeah, it's that time of year. So I wake a couple of days ago. I woke up and I'm all congested, and I'm all what on earth? Oh yeah, it's spring. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's like yay! It's both one of those yay! It's spring, less rain, and then at the same time, it's like oh, it's spring, all that pollen. It's, it's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so. so we'll be starting in just a moment. Mm -hmm. Okay. That? Is there a couple of people on? on? Huh? Okay, there's one person in Airmeet um, and a couple more people in uh, Facebook right now. People have been coming in and leaving. They've been participating, well, mostly commenting. Nobody's asked any questions so far. Oh, okay. So, hmm. Maybe I should okay. set up my Facebook so I can actually see the comments, but it might throw me off. I don't know. Let's see okay. how it goes. I, it's easier not to right now. Uh, okay. I will okay. not go through that pressure then. Okay. Now that I'm All right. You. So it's three o'clock um, right. today, right now in um, Art in Action. We have Lizzie D. Hill, a watercolorist, and uh, who is currently publishing or working, illustrating on a book called. When the fireflies come, or when uh, the came. fireflies came, sorry. Yeah. No, it's okay. And <laughs> she also has a coloring book, Wickedly Whimsical Witches. Yes. Oh, I got it right. Yes, you got it right on Facebook, too. It's a little tricky. It's almost, it's a tongue twister. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. So I will go ahead and get off, turn my camera off, and I will let Liz show you all her artwork and share with us her process. So, um, yeah, so I'm Lizzie D. Um, I feel like that's how I have to say it to get my brain into sync here. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so back in 2019, um, at, near the end of it, I did a Kickstarter for my coloring book, Wickedly Whimsical Witches. And um, I felt I, um, before I did it, I did research into Kickstarter. I'm all, okay, I could do this. And then when I started Kickstarter, there was things I was not prepared for. I was panicking and there was a, I ended up learning a lot. <laughs> so um, one of the things um, I learned from the Kickstarter was when you first sign up with Kickstarter and you're all, okay, I want to do a project. And they have this whole um, page of, well, here's all the things you could fill in and stuff. Um, let me see here. Let me share you. Two. Oh, the host disabled screen sharing. Do you think you could get that steam? Well, I'm working on it. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll continue talking. Just let me know. 
So, but there's this whole page where you fill out what your project is and it has the rewards and it has all the stuff. And it was very overwhelming to me. I am a traditional artist um, for the most part. I have been digitally, do digital stuff, very minor stuff. So tech, technology isn't exactly my forte, especially when you're on it, on, when I'm on a website I've never been before. Usually I have, I'm hanging on to my husband's hand telling me, what, what do I do next? Do I click that button? Is that okay? You know, so it was over overwhelming. And I'm like, oh, I can't do this now. I'm not ready yet. So I left it alone. And then when I felt like I was ready to fill everything in, I ended up discovering that that page was something that I could have started months before and come back to it whenever I wanted. And that was a huge mistake on my part. It delayed me so badly because I got so intimidated and scared by that page. So for those of you that would like to do a Kickstarter, understand that they do save things so you could come back later and it doesn't have to all be done in one fell swoop. <laughs> yeah. and most people might already know that, but I didn't. <laughs> And there's, when it comes to online and websites, I'm not the brightest crayon in the box. So yeah, it was definitely a new thing for me. Uh, um, were you able to get it going? Um, it says that all participants can share. Oh, there we go. I got it. Cool beans. Um, looks like it's going to be this one. Okay, so we're going to do there. You guys can all see that, the um, Kickstarter thing? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to have to check with you. Like, what, what what happened yesterday? I might be checking with you, Steen, to make sure that the screen's coming up right. <laughs> so this is my page. Um, they saved it from back then. So I had my own banner. There's, I for a time I thought I needed a video, which is awesome. I seen, I actually did a lot of research on what other people done with their Kickstarters and they had these videos and they looked beautiful and they had all these songs and they're all, yes, buy this. And I'm all, well, I would. Um, but um, that was something that I wasn't good at, but I did see that some artists just flat out went, here you go. Here's a banner. I'm all, okay, I'm going to play it safe. And that's a lot of what I did with this since I was a first timer was I was just playing it safe, which in this case, when I asked for my, um, for the pledges, uh, my goal was only 700 right down here. So I was trying to keep it small and simple so I could see how to do this. So when I go again, I'll be more prepared. So, cause obviously I wasn't prepared for this. But yeah, I had my story. Here's my rewards. They all had funny, fun, witchy magic titles to them. And um, it's a lot of thinking through things. Found out I wanted to do PDF file of the coloring book because I thought, yeah, that would be awesome. So if people don't want the book or couldn't afford to do just, you know, have a book shipped to them, they could do a PDF file. Found out we couldn't just do it any place. So we ended up doing Adobe um, Acrobat to get the PDF version of this. And so, yeah, it was a lot of learning experience going through this stuff. And um, I highly advise if anybody does decide to start a Kickstarter, really research and look into like other artists, like especially if they're doing something that you are doing, like look into the other coloring books and see um, and get as close to your kind of genre as possible. If you can find some fantasy colors or talk to some artists that you know, that have done them in the past and things like that. Um, I know I went through, um, I, there was a couple of um, artists I knew that did coloring books and through Kickstarter. So I was just went and found their pages and looked and see what they said. Cause you know, you want to give people warning that something might happen and you know, things like that. So, but yeah, that's my page. I was showing off some of my pages to the people and had my story. The reason I did this coloring book and, um, I was really happy for how well it went out. I actually did do a, um, scroll back down again, stretch goal, because I, I hit my mark and I'm all, wow, that's really cool. Okay, let's add an extra page. So um, my Witch Regina got thrown into the book, not the colored version. I 
I think I pointed that out. So no, there's a coloring page of the switch. So just to save myself, but, um, but yeah, there is that. Um, there were other, I can't remember what they're called, but there were some other things where people were expect. Um, one lady asked me, well, are you doing this one certain thing? I wish I could remember the name of it, but it's like another stretch goal, but it had some weird tweaks to it. And I'm all, I don't understand that. So all I could tell her was, if you wanted to get more things, just, you know, you can go back and back on something else. That's all I could tell her. So that's just kind of, you know, when you're new, there's only so much you can do, but it was a learning experience. And it's something that I will go back and find that comment and we'll see what we could do on the next book. So, um, Anyways, I'm going to stop sharing on this. And then I'm going to go to my photos. So, um, so for the Kickstarter, the reason I did the coloring book. In the past, I did these four paintings, well, three of them paintings. One of them was a color pencil marker. That's Wanna Ride right down here. I, um, it all started with her. She's my very first witch. And the reason I drew her is that it was Halloween time. And my son was, you know, he was really little, three or four years old. He's now a senior in high school. But um, at the time, I can never get him to go into a store because of the Halloween decorations. They were always... You know, you see body parts and guts and gruesome stuff. And that scared him. He didn't like that. But I kind of grew up on the whole, yes, I love Honda stories and, you know, those kind of things. But I've never been into the gore. So it's always been on the more traditional side that I enjoyed. And I thought, well, why don't I show him that there is a good side to Halloween? And so that's how Wanna Ride came to be. And then, like, a couple years later, I'm all, huh, I should do another Halloween thing. What should I do? I did attempt a vampire one, and it, it, it was okay. But I also, it was just witches. And so all of a sudden, mm, Tasty shows up, and then Lunar Landing. <laughs> and so it just turned into these witches. And I came to a point that I'm all, you know what, I'm just going to keep on coming up with witches. So maybe I'd just do a coloring book. And then people could just color witches. And it would be wonderful. So that's the reason it all started with just trying to show that there is a cute side, a sweet side to Halloween, even though there's still spooky things, you know, like the trees and bats. There's still those fun things and the pumpkins. So heading towards the young child. So um, back to the Kickstarter. When you decided I want to do a Kickstarter and if you, it's good to have some stuff going you want to start promoting it before you launch because that way you lure in people to um, help to support your Kickstarter when it starts and they have something to look forward to. So you give them teasers of, you know, here's some pictures or here's a sketch or two. Um, this is going to happen, you know, soon. So I would say about, I mean, two, three weeks before to start talking about it, promote it on your social sites. Um, so find, you know, tell people, yeah, tell so-and-so and things like that, spread it out. Um, oh yeah. And there's my books. Oh, and that's something else to think about because in the Kickstarter, when I put in my um, goal price, the goal price <laughs> not only covers, you know, the publishing of the book, which I'll tell you which company I went through, but it also covers like um, packaging. <laughs> And uh, it covers packaging and um, taxes. And you have to think that Kickstarter is going to want um, some money out of it too. They have a certain percentage. What it is now, I cannot say. You could, when you go in there, you could look and see what they have. And um, yeah, and shipping too, because all those things get applied to that. You could still, I mean, I was able to get more books than I had planned. And I was, and, and still be able to send all the, you know, did all the shipping, all that stuff. And, um, and still had a little bit of money back. So it's, 
you can gain some profit from Kickstarter, but don't expect it to give you, you know, enough to survive a year. You know, <laughs> it's just, it's all about making your product. So in this case, I now have books that I could take to conventions that I was so looking forward to in 2020 to sell them. And that did not happen. <laughs> it was like, yeah, 2020. I know that's such a, horrible year but I did take advantage of Halloween time I had a coupon and you know told people about it the best I can so I sold a couple online um so it was but they're still still tucked away in my closet there's sometimes people bring it up that I know that's um locally and I'm able to do work with them and whatnot so um but yeah, so you got to think about those things when you're thinking about your price and Kickstarter. Is that it's more than just saying I want these books. It's like no, you, there's also more to it. Um, so yeah, you totally want to promote yourself before, and um, and then you definitely want to do after. Um, but uh, so this is who I went through: PrinterCenterUSA.com. Um, they actually, if I am correct, they actually are in Montana. I really loved what they did for my book. And I thought the price was reasonable for what I got, which was a nice paper to color on. You can even color with marker and stuff. And, um, but it doesn't need, I mean, just because I suggest these guys doesn't mean it's not what you're going to want. If you do a coloring book, you could, I actually checked, um, a couple of companies um, that I have had artist friends suggest, oh, well, this is a really good one. So I checked it out. And then really nice thing about these companies is that they do send out samples. Some of them send it to you for free, like these guys. And some of them ask for like 10 bucks or something. But it's nice to get the samples because then you can actually say, this is the paper I want. This is the, you know, what I want my book cover to be like, the gloss and, you know, things like that. Because they have, at least these guys for sure, they have each piece of paper that they give you labeled with what kind of paper it is and, you know, whether it's good for color or not. They even had a sheet of paper that was all about coloring pages so you could color on it and stuff. So it was pretty nice. But yeah, this is the one I liked, but there's many more out there. So you could go and just shop around, see which one you would like. So um, other ways I promoted myself was not just online. I actually printed off some flyers. I think I still have some. I didn't get rid of all of them. But yeah, they were just these flyers. And when I went to conventions, I was handing them out um, to people. So whenever um, my husband found, um, got me this LED badge um, to put on my bag that I carried with me at conventions. And it, he programmed it to say, ask me about my Kickstarter. <laughs> It was a bright blue light. So many people, they would look at me and then they would look down and see this blue light. They're all, um, I guess I should ask you about your Kickstarter. <laughs> like, Where yes. did you get that? Um, he found it on Amazon. Oh, okay. So, um, but yeah, there were some people, like some of my friends, I would get, I'd go over and talk to them and they look down, they're all, you still have that on, huh? I was like, well, it lures people. <laughs> but yeah, so they would ask me because they saw this little badge and I go, yeah, here you go and gave them a flyer. So, um, but yeah, it, it worked out really nicely. And um, another thing nice about the Kickstarter um, site, there's only so much I could show you of my area, but there is a page for your project um, that like right now I can see it now, but in the past it will also show it. It's a graph site where it's showing this is how things are going and it also says this is where people are coming from like what social media is and what's luring them in the most so mm -hmm. um that was kind of neat to see that because then you're understanding where it's where people are coming from the most and then you could go oh well I should push on that one more I think I got a bunch of people through Facebook a lot um, I have my private page and I also have my business page and I used both of them because Facebook can be a, you know, a jerk when it comes to your business page. It's like you post a picture and you expect everybody to see it, but Facebook doesn't let that happen all the time. So I do a double say, um, a double send on both pages. So then everyone's all, oh, now I can see it kind of thing. 
but also we did buy promotion stuff. You know, we promoted it through Facebook. We did put in a couple of bucks for them to promote it. So that helped as well. It's not my favorite thing, but it worked. But yeah, it's just, and I mean, as I went through it, even after launch, I'm all, here's how things are going. This is what I'm doing. And, you know, just letting people see it. So no, um, I remember I was uh, following you at the time and you were giving updates. Yeah, it's very, um, I could say that if you do a launch, be, I mean, a Kickstarter, be prepared that you will be busy that whole time during that Kickstarter, um, your time limit there. So I, I think I did a 30 day, I did a month and um, you were just constantly letting people know I'm here still, this is what I'm working on and, oh, check this out and, oh, don't forget, you know, <laughs> so it's, it takes a lot of time and it was kind of a rough time. I had a couple of things come up and um, I think I had the Kickstarter go in November. My plan was in October because they were witches. But like I said, when I first hopped on to Kickstarter, I got very intimidated. Now, if anybody, I shift my eyes around. So forgive me. It's hard to make eye contact with a camera. <laughs> Sorry, but, um, but yeah, it got very intimidating for me to, um, to start it because I didn't understand what I was getting into. So it became very delayed, went clear into, you know, I finally started it, I think a little bit before Halloween and ended it a little before December. But um, yeah, so you had that. And I took advantage of the holiday saying, well, these witches aren't just for Halloween, you know, try to lure it into a different way because some of these witches, it's not all about Halloween. Yeah, she has the pumpkin and stuff. There's some witches with that. But, you know, my idea was to show these, which is trying to live everyday lives as witches. But um, but uh, what was that I was going to say? Oh, um, something else uh, before I start talking about some of these pages that I did. Checking the time, sorry. Um, is, I'll, I'll give you a time frame. Would you like me to give you like a 10 minute and then a five minute? Um, sure, sure. Okay. That'd be good. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, one of the biggest mistakes I did, and I'm surprised I pulled this off, was in my mind, I had planned, um, the book was already, I was already working on it. And I thought, oh, I'll just start the launch. I will have this done way before the end of the Kickstarter campaign here. I'll be good. No, I was frantically like at the last minute trying to get my pages to work. And um, I made a huge mistake. I, um, at first I was inking on my, in my book, but then I realized it was really hard to clean up in the computer. And so I had a tablet that had sketchbook on it, that program, wonderful program. And I'm all sweet. I will just ink everything in here and then transfer it to my computer. We can turn to pages, perfect. Sketchbook only does 72 DPI. And so when we transferred it and we're printing it off at a, you know, eight and a half by 11. Whoa, every, 72? <laughs> yeah, it became pixelated. So it turned into this whole out. We're on, you know, the last week of when this, this was supposed to be done. And so my husband and I, I am so grateful to have him, but you know, we just sat in, we got in there and was fixing the lines, trying to smooth them out and, you know, try to get it as highest quality as we possibly could, because I would feel horrible if somebody got a coloring book and everything was pixelated. So mm -hmm. lesson learned, don't use sketchbook for a coloring page. It won't work. <laughs> so, um, but. Do you have, um, I know that you work occasionally in Photoshop. Have you ever tried the line tool where you uh, like essentially put a dot with your, um, your, your brush, have your finger on shift and then go to another dot and it will automatically draw a straight line from point to point. Yes. Um, I think that's the pen tool. Mm -hmm. um, I had done that, but that's something I decided to learn after this incident. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because it was, that one is actually, um, to me, it was kind of complicated. 
like I said, I mean, uh, now I'm leaning more towards digital um, for um, a lot of things. Like, I mean, like if I take a painting to an art show, it is going to be a painting, not digital. But if I'm doing something like a coloring book or um, if I decide to do my comic book idea that I really want to do, it's going to be digital because... I feel it would be easier to put those things together there than if I tried to do them traditional. So I've been forcing myself to learn these things. And I actually took a page that never made it into the witch's coloring book that um, it was like a last minute. Oh, this would be fun. Oh, I don't have time. So I took that witch and I put her in um, Photoshop and was learning how to use the tools and stuff there. So, but yeah, the pen is, it's really nice when you want those straight lines. <laughs> so, but anywho, so um, at this point, I figured I would talk about some of the pages in my book, um, like, and I was hoping to show some of my, well, yeah, some of the sketches, like these are pictures from my sketchbook. So some of them are going to be really messy and I will do my best to point out what is going on in the picture because <laughs> I can see it, but I don't know if everyone else can. So, mm -hmm. but in Waterwise's case, she is my oldest. I don't think I, I couldn't find it. And I believe I do not have a sketch of her. The original was done in markers and color pencils. It might have been that I drew it and colored it all on the same page. And I no longer have that picture. I actually feel I need to contact my the customer who bought it all those years ago and say, is that still in good quality? Because I'm a little concerned uh, that age might be taking a toll on that one. I was actually thinking about that today. And she's such a wonderful, sweet lady. So, but yeah, this is the coloring page. And this is what the original looked like. Oops. Um, but yeah, some of the pictures are gonna be a little smaller. Oops, kind of, <laughs> some pictures didn't wanna show. So it's like, okay, these are gonna be the best I could do. But yeah, I did this one back in, ah, 2007. So I was still calling myself Elizabeth D. Hill there. So, but yeah, that was color pen, uh, marker with color pencil over the top. The next one is mm, tasty. Yeah, my titles are kind of weird, but um, I wanted to do a witch by her cauldron. She said, you know, having fun. One of the other reasons I like to draw these witches, I think, is the dresses. I love fashion. I love historical fashion, and I felt my witches needed a you know, the Bo Peep kind of dresses. So it was always fun to come up with fun designs for the dresses and, and things like that. So this was a first sketch idea of, I was thinking of for my witch in her cauldron, the mm, tasty. And then I started getting some other ideas and yes, I am being very nice and showing my pictures, my reference pictures. I use I take pictures of myself a lot because I feel every time I try somebody else to pose for me, I don't know what is with me, but somehow I never could get them to do what I want them to do. So it usually turns into me just taking pictures of myself. Sadly, though, when I draw guys it, that I can't really get away with that <laughs> in some cases. So it gets a little complicated, but that's how I did it. And my messy house. Luckily, I don't live there anymore. So that's not the same messy house that I live in now. <laughs> but yeah, so I posed for it, got my hands in there. I really wanted the hands. And then, oh yes. And my sister took a picture of their cats, um, Orange and Dundee. Orange is right there, Dundee's right there. But I wanted to get, I don't know why I didn't use my cat. Not sure, but I asked her to take some pictures of the cats doing stuff. So she took a couple and this is the picture I chose of Dundee and I drew it out. So here's my beautiful sketch of the, um, for the painting. And then, here, um, Oh, here's the coloring book version. I decided it needed a full moon. I actually had so much fun doing the moon. 
and just looking up the moon and getting all those textures. It's so exciting when you get the watercolors, you're making your watercolors do some strange stuff, but you're trying to control it and make it do what you want it to do. So when it's deciding to cooperate, it looks really awesome. So, and my orange cat turned into a black cat, but that's kind of the process of her. So that was mm, tasty. And then um, on some of these, some of them I could just draw them out. And then there's others where I have a simple idea and I need to just jot it down really quick. So this thumbnail is not probably like an inch and a half, two inches big, maybe. It's really small. So that's why it looks so quick because it's a small little piece on my page. But this is the start of Lunar Landing. I wanted a witch, and that's the other thing. These witches, um, like for instance, we got mm, Tasty. They're kind of, I put them as kind of dip, ditzy and a lot of who I am is put into these things. So I must, I, I guess I can admit that I'm kind of a ditzy person because I mean, who would try a potion? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, those are the things I wanted to do was that these witches, um, they are, very fashionable. They have grand taste in fashion, but they just have things happen to them. So <laughs> these are my, this is my pose. Once again, it's me. Um, but yeah, I made several pictures. I was in different poses trying to get what I want. This is the closest I got to what I want. And I, I don't know why the shadows did what they did, but that happened. I did not have a cell phone at that time. So it was all relying on a camera. So so I had to do a shot again. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it worked. And mm -hmm. it's what you can do. Just having those references just really helps you get an idea of what your person is doing. So, yeah. So here's the sketch. And then and people wonder why artists do self-portraits so often. <laughs> it's because you've got an Oh, an art uh, model right there willing to work with you. Exactly. That's the thing is that it's conveniently right there. And you want to get that model. You want that pose and you want it now. So I, you do what you got to do. So, but this is the coloring page of it. And a, a fun little secret. No, not a lot of people know about this one. So the pages, um, this one was done after the paintings. Uh, all the color pages of the four witches that I painted, those coloring pages showed up afterwards. I think I should have made it in that order, but oh well, you do what you can. So, <laughs> so these were all done after the paintings were done. This particular picture, Lunar Landing, there's actually two paintings. This was my first one. And, um, you know, I really loved it. I thought it was really neat. I showed it off at NorwestCon. And then I got some help from some fellow artists that talked about, wow, this is really cool, but I bet you can make it better. And I'm all, yeah, let's do this. <laughs> so I did it better. So this is the, you know, the final piece. This is what it turned into. I am very happy with it, though. I do love this one. But mm -hmm. yeah, it was definitely like, wow, this is, I am amazed I could do that kind of thing. It was one of those learning experiences that was so worth it at the end. And I love the texture and the stars. When watercolor cooperates, it is wonderful. <laughs> so, that, um, so the next one, oh yeah, that's right. This is my attempt at designing the book. And I have found that you can't just slap a painting onto a coloring book. It doesn't quite look right. This looks more like a storybook cover. Um, so I actually took the coloring page and gave it the background of the painting. And, you know, I, I did some tweaks and stuff. I actually did color her with color pencil. And I just couldn't get the moon to work with the color pencil. So that's actually digital yellow, but it worked and it looks like a coloring book. So I was really happy with how it turned out. So, um, broom malfunction. She started out as this and as fun as I like the idea, once again, I'm going 
you know, these witches don't know what they're doing. <laughs> and I really liked what I was going for here, but I didn't like what was going on here because the broom was all weird. Her legs, this is what happens when you draw out of your head and you do not have a model to pose for you at the time. You get um, proportion problems in which this case, it looks like the broom has just been stabbed through her leg, which we don't want that. So <laughs> I knew she had to change, but I loved my panicked kitty. So the kitty had to stay. And so I had photos of me posing and I was actually wearing a, a kind of a full skirt and um, I used a chair to help flail out the, sh the skirt so I could get it to puff and everything. That was, that was actually kind of funny to look at. I, I wish I had them. I couldn't find them. <laughs> Those were one of the things, well, I don't mind laugh at that one. That was great. But yeah, there was a lot of posing for that. But yeah, I switched her around to try to get balance in the painting. Um, and, but still right here, that mean I was just sketching that insane cat insert here. And that's what happened. I kept the panicking cat, but I was able to change everything else. Um, like I said, this was done after the painting. But um, here's the final painting, which I'm not quite happy about. I think it turned out really nice. Mm -hmm. So I think so too. Yeah. Once again, the clothing, it's just, and you know, almost all witches have striped stockings <laughs> and the whole, um, what do you call it? Pilgrim shoes or, mm -hmm. but yeah. anyways, so, uh, which Regina, I, Oh, she's my favorite. I have her. Oh yeah. Do you have original mm -hmm. or a print? I have a print. Ah, uh, okay. Cause I know I sell the original and I don't know the hard part of selling art at an art show is when it's an original and you don't meet the person that bought it. Cause I mean, in all honesty, when you are able to see the person and you know, they're all excited and they're all, wow, I am so looking forward to this. And da, 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 da. it just makes you feel so good. You get the warm fuzzies all over. So, but I am so happy that you enjoy your print as well. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> but you know what I mean with the original thing. Yes. So it's just like, oh, yeah, that's so good. I'm glad it's going to a good home. And it's like um, Lunar Landing, I actually never met the person that bought it. In fact, they bought it at Oricon. I remember this one so well because I, I don't know what happened to it. It was still there and the art show was all, well, if the person doesn't show up, you still get your money. I'm all, well, what happens to the painting? I, I want to know what happens to the painting. And I'm hoping that the person showed up and gave it a good home. Mm -hmm. That's that's kind of the hard part. So, but yeah, so if you ever, people out there, if you ever buy original and at the art show, try to look up that artist because we would love to see how happy you are. It makes it, you know, warm fuzzies are so awesome. But yeah, which Regina, back to which Regina. Um, she is actually an inspiration. I was playing a role playing game with some friends. Um, the game master, uh, he was, we were using um, the role playing books of Numenera, um, if people know what that is. Um, but he described a person that we were meeting was this old lady and um, who had, you know, he, this description that he did for her was so visual that I'm all, oh my gosh, I got to draw this. And this is what I came up with. And he even had it down to the green hat. There was a, a um, gray, uh, like a Russian blue kitty in her arms and all that. The cat talked, but it was just like, I have to draw this woman. So I did. And, um, you know, behold, Rich Regina. Um, and so and this is the coloring page version. This is what the reward for everybody was that this would be put in the book. And this is the final painting at the end. So she was fun. I don't do old people very often. And just the whole old musty you just could tell that she's just an old grumpy lady and she's wearing her coat that she loves and her top hat and she's just 
really not impressed with you across the table, but the <laughs> kitty, oh, that kitty loves her so much. <laughs> so, so, you know, she has a soft side. So, but yes, I very much enjoyed Witch Regina. So um, this coloring page is not, I'm outside of doing the paintings. This is about coloring pages. I figured I would talk about some that were a little more complicated. Um, this, I was just drawing different witches hats to get an idea of what other witches I could do. And obviously drawing over other things in blue. But I got the idea of a witch's hat store, which I totally agreed with. I wrote that down and went, yes. So it was really hard because I couldn't figure out my perspective. I was kept on, I'm all, oh, let's just do it easy. Let's do one point perspective. But I couldn't fit things in like I wanted them to. I'm bumping my table. I'm shaking my camera. Sorry. So it was a constant, well, do I do it this way? There's a thumbnail where, you know, there's the cat on the table again. I was really focused on that for some strange reason. Right here, we have a witch that is supposedly looking in a mirror. That was where I'm all, is that interpreting right? I don't know. I still like the witch up against the window looking at that dream hat. And, you know, again, let's move things around, but we're still not moving things around. I was really set on this angle. I don't know why. And then finally I went, this isn't working. Let's chuck this. Let's try, let's do two point perspective. And so that's what started happening. Everything was falling into place. I was able to fit things in, show it a hat shop. And also have a place for the shopper helper. So the kitties are the shopper helpers. And the final page turned out like this. The nice thing about digital is all the things that I was having problem with. You can see my arrows pointing saying something is wrong here. And, you know, my backgrounds and stuff. I was able to go into, you know, go online and uh, go into my program. The, the sketchbook was awesome, but you know, not good enough, but it was very helpful. Um, helped me get my perspectives in and I could do a fade with the grays to the blacks, move the lady. So she's looking at a different hat and give this kitty a little more recognition. I, the fun thing I had with this book was taking the kitties and make, either hiding them one way or another, or they're doing something in this case, and some people don't really notice, but there's a whole storyline going on between this kitty and this kitty. You could just tell he loves her. But um, anyways, <laughs> I have storylines in here. <laughs> so, okay, but, so we have 10 minutes. Yes. So, um, yeah, there was that one. And this one, this is my kitchen scene. I, I don't know it. I think I just called it kitchen because I'm being that creative at this point. Um, this is my thumbnail. I'm getting an idea of a witch being in the kitchen or her potion room. It's supposed to be her doing potions, but they're failing miserably. And um, instead, she's making confectionaries. And the whole idea is that the cat slid a baking magazine in front of her curses and spells book. And she's can't figure out why she's not making curses and spells. It is something that um, I would like to turn into more interpretive because every time I've shown this page to people, they always come up with something different. And, you know, it's sweet that they came up with these other ideas, but I really want to get that joke in where the kitty is at fault for all this yummy, scrumptious stuff. So but she hasn't figured it out yet. No. And it might be that her gesture's wrong. Maybe I need to change how her body is, her body language of it. And um, I've actually, my son saw this and he's all, are you going to paint that mom? I'm all, oh, no, it's going to be a coloring book. And he's all, well, you should paint it. <laughs> it's like, well, could be the next witch painting. Who knows? <laughs> so, but I very, I love drawing these fun little tidbit things, all those little fun details. There's plants here. There's actually a pond out here with a duck in it. And, um, you know, just fun stuff. Um, but, and since we're 
getting low on time. Some of these, you know, they're just sketches, getting the idea. And then, you know, I did try, like I said, I did attempt to ink on the paper, but when I scanned it, it just was so much harder. But I think what I needed to do at the end was transfer it to a clean white piece of paper. There's times that I really am not the brightest crayon on the box. That, that probably would have made the inking easier if I didn't do it digitally, but the digital was nice until I found out sketchbook isn't the way to go. <laughs> so yeah, but definitely it was, it was fun to do. These are some more sketches. I was trying to get my gesture drawings of a particular witch. I wanted kind of a Christmas page. Um, and in this case, it, you know, I got this big old mess going on here. Well, it's not a mess, but you know, it's my sketch, you know, and then I scanned it in and improved upon it. This one was fun, challenging, but it was a lot of fun. She actually had a bigger dress from my first design. I guess I don't have that one anymore. I was hoping to show how things could change. And these her. Some people think there's a cat there and I can see that, but they're actually cat earmuffs. I kind of put a nod to my childhood. I used to have a pair. <laughs> so, but I had this strange witch who ran around in like a 19, um, 10s, 1920s swimming suit, bathing suit for women who had an umbrella that didn't protect her from this. Well, it, you know, there was no sun. It didn't protect her from the rain. It was a raining umbrella. I'm kind of twisted that way. I don't know why that would make sense, but I kept going at it. And I once came up with an idea. I drew this out. I thought, wow, we're going to paint this. And this is years ago. And it was fun, but it wasn't quite clicking with what I wanted. And so I tried a different approach. I had a friend model for me because uh, I really liked her face and started leaning towards more along the lines of a parasol, more shaped umbrella, talking to ducks. And then we get the coloring page at the end. Some of these pictures, like this one, it's an older one. And I'm all, this is never going to turn into a painting, but it would be cool to turn it into something which is another nice thing about coloring books is that there's some stuff that are not going to turn into, um, you know, into a piece of artwork, but it's nice to put it into something so somebody could still appreciate it. And it gives them the freedom to color it the way they think it should look like. So I, I thought that was fun. So I press next. This one, Actually, <laughs> I cheated on this one. The original is this. This is like, oh, yeah, there it is. 2007. I did it for my sister. And she's from, she's the year of the rat. So she has a pet rat. In the coloring page, there's a kitten. Because I got to keep up with the cat theme. So, but. Five minutes? Yes. And I am almost done. I mean, you get up with, you get some ideas like this one. If you cannot see it right here is the head. This, this witch is yelling. She is stuck up in a tree and feet are kicking. Here's an owl with the witch's hat. I did not do it that way. Instead, it turned into this. Kept the owl, but you know, things change and it makes it fun that way. Fashion. I, went into drawing some fun dresses and because Pinterest is awesome that way, look up costume fashion or just fashion in general. And yeah, you got me lost for the whole day. These are just, <laughs> yeah, it, it's good bad. I have this saving file of fashion fun and there's all of these costume ideas. It's like, I'm never going to make them, but I could draw them. <laughs> so the last of these are just some of the pages for my book. And yeah, I had some racers. I love, I had to laugh at the number 13 lucky number. All the witches have kitties on them one way or another. If you look really hard, they're there. Each of them have kitties. So, and, you know, made their sports gear look fashionably frilly <laughs> and, you know, gave their hats a more sporty aerodynamic form. 
And this one was from an old painting that I didn't really care for. And I took it and I'm all, I could do stuff with this and made it something I could enjoy. So have a woman that totally messed up on her hair. Now she's a cat. So, you know, just fun things. And, but yeah, I really enjoyed doing this. I like ha hiding little things in with it. Like this, the picture of her grandma, great grandma, who knows how old this witch was. Um, she has a brooch there, but yet she inherited the brooch um, for her hat. And like I said, fashion, it's so awesome. Fun little things. I, I like people to kind of, if they, you know, even though the kitchen doesn't interpret the way I want it to, it still gives people a story and they make it up as, you know, they look at it and go, oh, this is what's happening. So it's fun to hear what people come up with for stories when they look at these pictures. And, oh, that's the last one. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun. I, I definitely am going to be, I'm already planning on making another coloring book. I wanted to do something to do with fairies or magical creatures kind of thing. And um, hopefully the plan was to do it this year, but I have been busy <laughs> yeah. working on other things. And, but hopefully sometime soon I will have that going. And once again, I will be going through Kickstarter with a little more knowledge of how to use it. So, but um, for those that are listening, um, until Monday, I do have a sale on both the book and the PDF on my website. So if you want to have your own copy or have it on your computer to, so you could color to your heart, heart's content, you could just go to my website. Um, it's, um, I don't know if my your website link is, yeah, your link is actually on the uh, Art in Action page. It is. Oh, cool. Yes. Cool. Okay. So yeah, you could go there. And if you decide, well, I'll think about it and come back later, you could go to my booth. My link is there. I am not going to be on uh, the whole time after this. I will be hanging out at my booth for an hour. Um, so if you wanted to come over and chat or you have any questions, um, please feel free um, to come visit. I, I love to talk, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> but um but yeah oh and also i threw in i'm so last minute i do have a coupon um for my art um my website for it's um for my prints just the prints um it is called norwestcon 43 i actually put that down on my booth site in the description you'll see that i wrote that down so you can pick out some prints put it in cart Type in NorwestCon43, and it would it should give you a discount, 25% off. Um, fair warning for those that want to check it out. My website's had some weird issues. So the buttons, they look blank, but when you put your mouse over it, <laughs> it shows up. And it does work. I tested it. It, it, it works. It's okay. <laughs> So okay. I, I'm all, I can't send people through this and not have problems, but yeah, I, there you go. Yeah. I went through your website. I know last night and everything seemed to be working fine. Oh, good. Cause I see it on my end and I'm all, Oh, great. Everyone's going to run away. They're not going to like it. <laughs> they got to fix things. So yeah. Okay. Things happen. So Yeah. Well, you know, I had, I have your coloring book, but I hadn't really gone through it and uh, looked at all the, all the little kitties and everything. So now I'm going to have to go through. I have the PDF format. Oh, okay. Yeah. The fun thing is, is when you're with um, little kids and you show them the book, they're all, can you find the kitty? And all of a sudden it's a, you know, search and find, where's the kitties? Mm -hmm. So it's most of the, I mean, they're mostly easy to find, but it just makes them go, oh, there's something to this. Each witch, every witch has a kitty. Mm -hmm. So some of them have more kitties. So, Yeah. All right, so that's that's it for Art in Action. Um, we are done. Uh, the, this will be up on YouTube uh, probably until the end of NorwestCon. If you are interested in looking it up, it's NorwestCon 43, and it should have the entire Art, of action, art in Action from yesterday and also today. Um, 
we were only part way on Twitch. We uh, lost a lot of participants as soon as Twitch turned off. Um, and that was because they were using Twitch for something else. So we only had a couple hours on Twitch. And that cut off a little bit into yours. Oh, okay. Um, uh, but you were on the Twitch channel yesterday. Okay. So everybody was on there for at least an hour. Cool. Okay. So, well, thank you very much. That was really interesting. I didn't realize that it would be so difficult to try to do Kickstarter. I hadn't thought of all those other little things. Yeah, that was part of my problem was like, oh, totally going in this, you know, start typing away. And all of a sudden you're all, no, you can't just do that. And mm -hmm. like I said, my husband really helped me out. He's all, no, we got it too. You know, he's like mm -hmm. that. He's my common sense that, you know, Jiminy Cricket thing, I guess. I don't know. But mm -hmm. he kind of helped me get myself on track figure it out easier. I think if it was just me, I probably would not have had the coloring book even done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but, okay. Uh, anywho, All this right. was fun. Yeah, well, thank you. I This turned out, I, I really had my reservations because I was like, oh, we're just... Yeah, I think we're just all making it up. I, I don't know how this is going to turn out. But I think it turned out pretty good. Yeah, I did a pretty good job making things up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, enjoy the rest of the convention. Thank you for your time. I, I really think that your participation really made this event successful. And I do think it was very successful. Oh, that's good. That's good. I missed out on some of them. i looking forward to see the recordings. <laughs> yes. So. Uh, Brittany got a lot more done on her um, cutout butterfly. Oh, butterfly, yeah. Yes. And Dang, I can't do that. Oh, you definitely have to watch Hannah's. Uh, she had some really interesting things about manuscripts. Uh, for instance, there's a, um, oh, now I can't remember, a patron demon of scribes. And it was back in the medieval times, they blamed their mistakes on a demon who uh, caused the mistakes because they were engraving or they were copying down um, a lot of uh, holy words. And so if people would copy from the original manuscript, so any mistake a demon could get in there would be repeated again and again. So Interesting. I, it was, yeah, it was funny. Huh. Yeah, I'll have to check that one out. So, and, and Brittany, just see how that butterfly turned out. I'm like, nope, I can't do that. I'll just go on Cricut, tell them what to do. It's not going to be fancy. <laughs> so I, I did a shadow box once, and it was a pain in the butt just working on it on Cricut. It was mostly just trying to get everything in the box and making it look good. It was just like, mm -hmm. yeah. But it turned out cool. Okay. Not as cool as hers, though. <laughs> oh, no, hers is... Yeah. Magnificent. Amazing. Oh my gosh. He talks about portals into other worlds and, and that's what it is. You're, you're looking like through a hole into another universe, which I really liked. Yeah. It was really cool watching her work on it yesterday, hearing her talk about it. Okay. Oops. I just realized I had turned off my, my camera. I'm all are we, down in here. Are we no longer live? You know, I think we are live, so oh, we'll just go ahead and stop now. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. It was fun spending time with you. Yeah. And hopefully next year we'll actually all be in the same building. and In person. In person. It would be so nice because, I mean, not as a nice being able to talk to other artists, but like I was saying earlier about um, when you sell an original, it's always nice to talk to the um, the people, the customers and stuff about it. And it gives it more meaning to them too, because they get to talk to the artist and mm -hmm. it just, it, it becomes a special thing, I think. So. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. All well, righty. Have a nice weekend. I know Easter is tomorrow. Yeah, we so. are. We do the Easter bunny today. I already got sick off of candy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> All right. Bye. Thank All right. you. All right. Bye.